take it away. Hello, everyone. Greetings and welcome to a presentation about bridging the gap between in-person and online instruction. Um, do you want me to introduce myself first? Yeah, this is okay. So I'm Dr. Tom Field. Uh, both of us are in the Master of Arts in Counseling program, the U.S. program, um, and we are primarily an on-ground program. I would say about 80% of our class work is in seat. About another 20% is online, and we're going to talk to you today about how we integrate some online uh, instruction into what we're doing in the classroom with students. And I'm Dr. Joyce Panepin. I'm in the same program, and uh, I'm very interested in talking about this to you because it was my first time to do it, uh, especially the program that we used uh, in our classes, Tom and I. So I'm very excited to share our experience. So what we're going to do is walk you through the instructional cycle to begin with. So what we mean by that is how you teach students, the, the way in which you teach students. We'll talk about our own process of doing that, and then we'll talk about how we embed, integrate technology into that, and then we'll give you a case example from a class that we have both taught this fall about how we use technology to inform what we were doing in classroom situations. We should mention at the front of this that this presentation will be particularly useful to those of you who are teaching primarily in seat and want to integrate technology into what you're doing. It may be helpful to some programs who are mixed mode or primarily online, um, but just know that you may need to make some tweaks if you're primarily an online program, uh, especially uh, if you're not necessarily, if you don't have a lot of in-seat uh, processes there. But maybe the instructional cycle and that, that, that concept could be useful to you regardless. Okay, so we're gonna to talk to you first about the instructional cycle. What is the instructional cycle? It's a method of teaching whereby you're looking at the, basically how a student learns, what is involved in the learning process, what are the components of what you're doing with students to help them master concepts, knowledge, skills. So that's the instructional cycle. And we'll start from the top and we'll work our way around. So the first part to, to most instructional cycles is reading meaning a student will read material or content outside of a class session as they prepare for the week, and then they will enter the class session and get ready for the week that way. We have a, one message here, I just wanna make sure this, okay, nothing's all right. So uh, anything you wanted to add about reading, Joyce? No, not really. Uh, all I can say is that I think for every course, for example, you know, with in my text, the text that I use, I ask students to read in advance so that when they come to class and when we do activities in class, they don't have to go back to their books. So the process is they read the material before they come to class. Yes. I think most of us have the expectation that students arrive to class prepared. And I think part of the preparation usually involves doing the reading before class. So they have some of the book knowledge that then they'll be expounding upon in the class setting. Next, we have a lecture. Now, the variety of ways that you can do lecture, you know, just depend on your style as an instructor. Some people like to do, for example, video lectures that you will watch before a class session. A lot of the time, though, there'll be a brief kind of lecture in the class session itself. And oftentimes this will reflect on the readings, reinforce key concepts, maybe even add some additional uh, elements that were not covered in the reading. Anything you want to add to uh, lectures, Angelus? Not really. I think you got it there. Because after they read, uh, when they come to class, all I'm adding is more information. And sometimes a brief summary using PowerPoint, that's what I'll use for the lecture. Uh, that's how I've done it sometimes. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of students want that reinforcement, that at least we found, right? Mm -hmm. That students will read, and maybe there are concepts they want clarified, or um, based on their readings, they just want to go over it again with you. It's almost like they want to have the conversation about the content now that they've done the reading. Next, you have um, guided practice. Just want to make sure, okay. And guided practice is where you are now using the content, the, the reading, the lecture, to drive some of the, uh, the activities in the classroom. And especially in a counseling program, and I think this is true in other settings as well, 
students want to develop not only knowledge but also skills. And it's very hard to develop skills by reading a text uh, or even being lectured on a specific skill. You really have to practice it to learn it. And so I think what, what often happens is you do kind of the content knowledge and then you move towards skill as you start to um, uh, kind of, I don't know, move forward in your learning process. Yeah, and you know, program, students need that because what their, their profession is about doing. And so we guide them through activities in the classroom um, and all sorts of fun stuff to do because it's also intense. You know, the subject that we deal with most of the time is intense. And so the guided practice when we, from the content to the practice, them practicing helps them to prepare for what they'll be doing in the field. And so that's what I've noticed that the students really like to see themselves practicing and not just listening to you. Yeah, for sure. Students really enjoy experiential learning. Right? They, they enjoy, a lot. most of them do, they enjoy being able to practice things. And so the more you can integrate that, usually the more the student is in, is, enjoys the class and will give you positive feedback, which leads to feedback. <laughs> <laughs> So when you're doing guided practice, it's especially important that you receive feedback from the, your instructor and from peers, if you can, about the practice that they're doing. I think it's one thing to practice, but it's another thing to get feedback on it, meaning people will not necessarily learn skills without feedback. It's, we often have blind spots when we practice new things. We often want some guidance about things that we can kind of adjust or improve. And so I think feedback is a critical part of that process. Yes, and then in our program too, it's really about feedback because when they graduate, when they're out in the field, the whole idea is that they will be giving some sort of feedback to clients. So how good are they at, getting, at receiving feedback? So the feedback is so important and students really want that feedback actually because after the lecture and then they do the skills, they practice, they want to know whether they actually got what you taught them. And so the feedback helps them to really solidify what they're learning. Right. Next we have independent practice. And so far everything we've talked about happens offline really. Uh, unless there are readings online that you're doing, there's, let's say, an assigned article that's online, or maybe there's a video you're watching online before class, you have the pre-class, then you have the during class, and then the independent practice really should happen after class. And this is where you can use a lot of technology usefully. And we'll talk about our use of technology in a, in a specific course in a moment. But in, in sum, in brief, at this point, a student in their process should be able to understand what the skill looks like, to have gotten feedback already in their performance, and then be able to practice outside the class without a, a, a whole lot of guidance, uh, a whole lot of directives. So they, they need to obviously have some degree of um, expectation there about you know, what they're going to be practicing, but they don't have someone sitting over their shoulder at that point. Then they're doing more independent practice. And you don't want a student to dive right into independent practice before they've had more guided practice feedback, meaning you kind of want to mentor students, guide them a little bit in the skill that they're learning before they have the opportunity to practice independently. And after that, you know, guided practice and feedback, they've learned all that. And when they're practicing by themselves, they feel a sense of autonomy over what they will be doing by themselves, independent of the professors in the classroom. Yeah. So that's what's exciting about what we're going to talk to you about. For sure. And that autonomy is really important because, again, if you are a student, you want to have that independence. You want to have that autonomy. But if you have it too early in the process, you may be missing large, you have, may have got large gaps in your skill. And if you're not getting feedback, you may think that you're actually uh, quite skillful where you have gaps to address that you're not even aware of yet. And then after independent practice, we have feedback at the start of the next class period. I think this is important because whenever you have um, an opportunity for independent practice, you still want feedback on your work as a student. And so when students practice independently, 
of the next class period, you want to bring back some feedback about how the student was doing. And oftentimes, you can do this thoughtfully as a faculty member by, for example, reviewing student work, asking students to, to if you can uh, use some like really uh, exemplary examples in the classroom and then share with other students so they get a sense, again, reinforces what it is that they're meant to be demonstrating. Yeah, and students, when we did what we did last quarter, students were actually happier and they felt like they learned more when they had that feedback after they independently did the practice. So I think it, it's a good thing. Right. So to summarize, before we move on to our example, I think it's very important to understand the kind of an underlying concept of the instructional cycle, which is that learning primarily occurs through repetition. You want exposure and you want the ability to practice things over and over again with feedback. So repetition is important, feedback is important. And if you can integrate those things into the learning process, you're going to help students master competencies a lot more readily than if a student does not have the opportunity for repeated practice and if the student is not getting feedback on their work. Too often courses will just have reading and some kind of lecture where the student is, does not have the opportunity to practice and they do not have the opportunity for feedback. And then at, at that point, are they really learning? Are they really gaining competence in the way we want them to? And so I think as the instructor, it really behooves you to be thoughtful about how you are approaching instruction and how you're helping students to master key competencies within the course. Our, our program is about doing, again, I'm going to use that, that word. And so for the students, what they know is that when they have to do something in the field, when they get that feedback, they practice and then they get the feedback. They know they are doing the right thing or they are going the right direction. And it's so important for them. Yes, agreed. Agreed. So I hope that helps make sense of why the instructional cycle is important and what the components of uh, the instructional cycle might look like. And it can vary, of course, by the type of course you have. But in general, if you're applying the principles of repetition, of feedback, um, of reinforcement, all of that is, is helpful with, with student learning. Okay, we're going to move to our next slide. So we're going to give you next an example of how we've used the instructional cycle in a specific course and have integrated technology into that course as a way to kind of facilitate, augment, strengthen what we're already doing with students. So let's just talk through this. The, the, we were uh, teaching together two sections of an introductory course to counseling, you know, our 501 course, kind of like you know the 101 course for graduate students in counseling. And this course essentially is focused on helping students to understand the basics of, of active listening techniques, um, foundational kind of counseling skills, so that they understand what it is a counselor does before they start learning about other aspects of the curriculum. And it's important for students to take this early in our program because a lot of the students will start actually seeing clients within the first couple of quarters of their program. And so they need to be able to demonstrate some very basic counseling skills before seeing a client. So what is it that we're doing here? So at the, we follow the instructional cycle. Before the start of the class period, they, uh, they complete a reading. And often the reading for this class is centered on micro skills. What is micro skills? They're like a very specific um, behavioral, behaviorally um, defined skill. So for example, um, reflection of content is a, is a very introductory level skill that involves a person listening to, a, 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 to the speaker, being able to reflect back or paraphrase the meaning of the content that they're being provided with in kind of a surface level way, just being able to basically um, filter and paraphrase what you said. So that would be a, an example of a micro skill that a student would be learning uh, within their first course. And also, one of the basic things is just the use of the body in the counseling situation. Like, uh, do they have good eye contact? Are they able to look at the client without intimidating the client? without the client feeling like, okay, what's going on? Uh, or are they present? They're showing that they're present for that uh, client. So 
for micro skills, really we're doing the basic counseling skills. And the, I always tell the students that you already have these skills and this class is about naming those skills uh -huh. because you're already interacting with people out in the field, in the world. And so now you're going to be interacting with clients. And so there's a way that we interact with clients and everything that we know of how to interact with another human being is all of a sudden put in a different way yeah. in a counseling setting. Yeah, for sure. And so I think that you get a sense here for what a micro skill is. It could be non-verbal, as John Joyce is mentioning. It could also be a more verbal kind of skill like reflection of content. And students will read about that before they begin to practice it in the class setting. So they come to class, they've done their reading, and then there's a lecture on the micro skill uh, that we reviewed for that week. And so we'll talk about nonverbals, or we may talk about a reflection of content, just to make sure that all students have a working understanding of that term and how it's used. At times, we may also demonstrate that as the instructor. Now, that's the other thing. Sometimes modeling can be quite helpful in the instructional process. Next, what we'll do is divide students into teams and we'll have them practice the skill mm -hmm. and we'll give them feedback. So we'll kind of bounce around the room. You'll divide up the room, get them into different corners of the room. Sometimes you may need multiple rooms depending on the size of the class. You'll go around and you'll give them feedback on how they're doing as a group. Um, and that's very useful to students because they want to get feedback, they want to practice, and they want some degree of oversight on your part. They want to feel like they're supported when they're learning a very kind of elementary skill. Um, so I think that, that the, the observation and feedback that you give is important. It's also noteworthy that the way you structure the teams matters. So for example, having a, what we call a triad or having four people uh, with a quartet within a team is useful because those people, those extra observers, get to also give feedback to students about their performance, about what they're doing well or not doing well, um, and that feedback from peers is also useful in learning the skill and practicing it. Yeah, and uh, so besides sometimes doing it in the classroom setting, we also use the counseling center here at uh, City U, uh, for example, and our students go in the rooms and then they videotape their uh, triads. They videotape that and then they get, they get feedback in the room while they are videotaping, and then later on, for the, for the next week, they will go over what they did with the whole class. So the whole class also gives feedback uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the triad that practiced that week. And sometimes it can be daunting for some students, yeah. uh, but uh, we try so hard to make them realize that this is a learning situation. They're not going to be perfect. And so, uh, and just to take it as a learning moment and the feedback is because it's coming from all the other students. Uh, so it's huge and they actually really appreciate it at the end of the quarter. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, so students don't usually like to be videotaped as Joyce mentioned, yeah, it's pretty common. Uh, but I will say that it's, it is beneficial as a student to be able to watch other students get feedback, to learn almost vicariously through them and then when it's your turn to, to present videotape and get feedback, um, you also feel like you get kind of a consultation with the professor in kind of a large fishbowl kind of set, set up. If you're not familiar with fishbowl, it's where you have a lot of observers around the side watching the action in the middle. Um, and so that can be quite useful to implement into a classroom setting, particularly when you're learning a specific skills. Again, you wouldn't be able to do a lot of that online, but you can do that some of that in the classroom. Um, so once you've given that feedback, the students have the opportunity to either observe or consult with you. Then they, the student would do independent feedback using a, a technology-based system that we used called TheraView. And in TheraView, basically, there are case vignettes, videos, about 30 seconds each long, of a specific skill that you're meant to practice with a client. So you may have a client pre present um, and the client tells you that they have these kind of I don't know, lingering symptoms of depression, let's say, and you're asked to reflect content back to them. So the skill would be being able to paraphrase, let's say, a 30 to 60 second response in about 15 to 20 seconds in a way that gets the essence of what the person was saying and clearly communicates understanding. And so the student videotapes themselves 
responding to the video, the pre-videotaped uh, vignette. And then you as the instructor through TheraView get to review their recording and give them feedback on whether or not you think it met their expectations of the rubric. And there are rubrics that we use for each of those uh, skills. So in other words, the student has the opportunity by this point to read about the skill, to have a lecture about the skill, to practice the skill in teams with feedback in the classroom, and then to independently practice the skill outside of that setting. And I think it's particularly useful in a counseling uh, environment to have something like TheraView, because at least in my experience, during the in-class team exercises, students may be trying to master some very elementary skills even later in the quarter, um, and they may not be able to evidence specific skills that are more advanced later on. So let's say you have a skill like, I don't know, um, not to go into too technical terms, but something like immediacy, which has to do with being able to respond to the here and now interaction, the immediate interaction you would have with uh, with a client, so how you feel personally in the immediate moment of the counseling session. Let's say a student isn't able to demonstrate that during their team exercises, they still have the opportunity during independent practice to demonstrate that. And so it's another way of making sure students have an opportunity to practice all of the skills, even if in the classroom setting they can't demonstrate all of them at that, at that moment. And it's also at a close contact for them to see themselves, because they do see themselves responding to the uh, case that they are actually observing or listening to. And uh, so it was very interesting hearing them talk about how seeing themselves demonstrating the nonverbals or just the how, you know, just how they were able to use this skill. They, you know, they actually said it was very helpful for them. It was scary, they would say. It was intimidating to see oneself, but uh, they said they learned a lot from that. That's true. Students were very satisfied with their review. They liked using the product. Okay, what the last bullet we have, and we're almost out of time, it's very important to also mention, as we did earlier, that what you then do, what we were doing, would be to select exemplary example skills in therapy that students had demonstrated and to ask students if they felt comfortable to share some of those videos in class the next week so that the whole class, again, is reinforced with, okay, what does the skill look like for the client? And by this time, all of the students have practiced with that specific vignette, so it gives them very concrete feedback in how they may demonstrate the skill with that vignette. So by this point, you've fit, kind of wrapped up the instructional cycle for that skill set, and you're ready to move on to another skill set and follow the instructional cycle again. So in other words, you would follow the instructional cycle several times during a course, depending on the type of competency or skill that you want the students to master. And if you use that kind of flow, by the end of it, the students are going to feel like they actually leave with some competencies that they can continue to grow and, and develop. Yeah, it was, they actually said they were, especially the students that really, really liked it, they felt like it, they got something out of it and the skills stayed with them, especially after getting the feedback. Because they would do send in, you know, one time and then you give feedback and then they send it now feeling good about having done the right way. Right. You know, so, so it was, yeah, yeah. it was good to see them uh, feel satisfied with that. Yeah. So we are at time. We have tried to present to you uh, as briefly as we could what we have been using uh, the instructional cycle for with our students. And we hope it's been helpful to you that you'll take away at least a nugget of learning there about thinking deeply about how students learn and how you can adjust your instruction based on how students learn. Um, and to, especially if you're doing more skills or competency-based instruction, um, to, to make sure that you have those key ingredients of, just to kind of summarize here, uh, feedback, repetition, and modeling can also be useful. We talked about that. Um, and the ability for students, you know, just uh, to get some very kind of direct reinforcement about their learning from readings and from lectures. So that concludes our presentation today. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And if you want to, you can email us both uh, and ask for the questions. You just put in Tom Field or Joyce and Pande Finn, and you'll find us on the CityU email chain. And we'll look forward to chatting more about this with you. Thank you all. Thanks.
All right, well, thank you for attending our Hanoi virtual classroom. Thank you, uh, Dr. Field and Dr. Mafande Finn for that wonderful presentation. Please fill the survey out uh, that is going to be on your chat box right now. Uh, and we will see you back in five minutes for our uh, panel discussion.